Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. We're very happy today to have Jens, Jens Eisert, one of the experts on quantum information. He's talking to us from uh, Germany where he's attending a meeting, in fact, left a meeting advising the government and will tell us about a single T-gate value quantum makes quantum distribution learning hard. Jens, we're very much looking forward to your talk. <laughs> That's too kind. Um, let me share the screen. It's the most spoken sentence of the last year. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? So you can see me, you can hear me, and presumably also work. now see my slides. This is absolutely wonderful. Um, good. So <laughs> thank you very much. You're too kind. Um, thanks for the wonderful for the kind invitation to this truly wonderful online talk series. It's great to be here, at least virtually in these still somewhat awkward times. My great pleasure to participate in this um, seminar of the Mathematical Picture a Language uh, um, program, like a program that's very close to my heart and also my group's heart. And um, if you could see the, the pictures on the blackboards in our discussion room, you would see how much um, this is a true statement. So in this talk, we will kind of quite frankly, see that a single T-gate can make quantum distribution learning hard. Like more to the point, we will see in what precise way we can hope quantum machines, quantum devices to exhibit some sort of a, of a quantum advantage in meaningful and mathematically well-defined machine learning tasks beyond classical capabilities. Now, one of the reasons we are so excited about these days is that quantum computers not only promise advantages beyond the means of classical computers or classical in computational tasks, but also, and this is a comparably new development, is that this promise seems to be moving closer and closer to reality, mostly for, for good reasons, I'm tempted to say, um, as, as you said, I'm just consulting the government. It's kind of um, an interesting time we are in. So indeed, recently, as I've seen an enormous progress in developing quantum hardware, um, and in, 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 in many ways, that's a, an exciting development, no doubt about this, but the elephant in the room, if you want, is the question whether we can hope noisy and realistic quantum devices to provide some sort of speed up over classical computers and in what way we can make this notion of a speed up rigorous in mathematical terms. Now for very much paradigmatic problems, there seems to be strong evidence that quantum machines, quantum devices can do better than classical computers. So this is in particular true for so-called sampling problems. And if you think about this, every problem, like every native problem in quantum mechanics is at the end of the day, a, a sampling problem like when you go into the lab or somebody else goes into the lab, never let a theorist into a lab. If you just natively take data in an experiment, you're performing some sort of sampling experiment. Now it turns out that there's like fine engineered and specific sampling experiments of the type that you can do them in labs, but you cannot produce samples from the same distribution classically or a similar distribution or sampling up to a distribution uh, for, of a distribution that's close in a certain sense, like in the L1 distance sense with constant error in the L1 distance is classically hard under mathematically very much plausible um, assumptions. But these experiments you can do and they have been done to spectacular um, attention. And these are like paradigmatic settings where you see that quantum devices can do more than classical machines. Actually, I was in, in Santa Barbara at the time working with the Google AI team when this first result came out and it was kind of funny that literally every Uber driver and every free shopping newspaper would be talking about that. It was the talk of the town that machines, quantum machines can do better than classical devices. Now, there's a lot to say about this. Um, we just put out a review article on all the complexity, theoretic and mathematical fine print of these quantum sampling schemes and also the the questions of, of classical simulation and quantum experiments. I'm, I would be very happy to hear more feedback about this as the article has not been put out in print yet. It's also interesting to see that there's like 
funny and somewhat ironic aspects coming into play concerning the verification. You can do these experiments, but it's not so obvious how to verify the correctness of these experiments. So what people do commonly is like linear cross entropy benchmarking, which is um, uh, sample efficient, but computationally inefficient. So that you cannot efficiently like verify whether the device is doing the right thing. Also like black box verification, meaning taking data and it, judging from data alone in a device independent fashion, whether the distribution was close to the anticipated one or absolute away in the total variation distance, that alone can't be tackled with polynomially many samples. So there's kind of interesting and uh, ironic twists coming into play when you want to verify the correctness of these sampling schemes. If you have some trust in your devices and think that your detectors are doing something similar than you think they're doing, then you can do notions of quantum verification. We've thought of quantum advantage settings where you can take data and you get a quantum advantage, but you can also use quantum data of the same type of a similar type to kind of verify the functioning of the scheme. And any time within the next week or so, we should put out data from a paradigmatic trapped ion experiment with our friends in Innsbruck that would show like a paradigmatic setting that if scaled up would show a quantum advantage, but it can also be efficiently verified in the correct function. So that's interesting. It shows that we are living in times where quantum devices seem to be able to do things that are outside the capabilities, the possibilities of classical computers. And there's all a mathematical underpinning of this that, that we can kind of root these advantages in, in, in notions of computational complexity. That's surely very exciting. At the same time, to be fair, these settings are not really practical applications in a way. They're rather sharpening our mind, theoretically speaking, and like challenging experimental scientists from the technological perspective, but they're not really solving any problem like world hunger, COVID, whatever. They're not really tackling any um, practically minded task. But it's still good to see that as of today, quantum machines can in some ways do better than classical devices. So that's encouraging. It's a, an interesting state of affairs and we are living in interesting times, no doubt about that. But of course, people are asking, great, what next? And good answers to the question, what next? Depend a bit who you ask. If you ask people with a more physics-y background, when you say, what's the next thing to think about? They would say, oh, we should really think about programmable quantum simulators. So devices that are somewhat intermediate between analog quantum simulators that we already have to like enormously large scales and noisy digital quantum computers that we also have, but they are small and noisy and kind of try to see whether we can combine the best of both worlds in one way or the other. And that's surely a very exciting um, state of affairs. If you ask people, interested in quantum algorithms, many people would say that it's an exciting idea to think about variational quantum algorithms. So algorithms where the, the precious quantum resource is sitting in the center and is surrounded by a larger classical algorithm that provides the control of the variational quantum circuit. You take data at the end of the day, and then using that type of data, you would, you, I mean, you would feed that into the classical algorithm and would provide a, a kind of efficient classical update of the variational quantum parameters and kind of take turns in that setting, hoping to provide better approximations in hard combinatorial optimization problems or so, or in notions of quantum chemistry. And one can think of instance of quantum assisted machine learning. And this is what we will spend our time with for the rest of this talk. Now, this makes a lot of sense, given that machine learning, it's really hard to deny, has changed the world we live in, let this be in the supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement learning. It's ubiquitous. In any kind of speech recognition, language, mathematical picture recognition, algorithm for that matter, machine learning will come off, play a role in based on earlier measurement data. Um, so 
given the importance of machine learning in so many algorithms and the ubiquitousness in our modern lives, it makes a lot of sense to say, or to ask the question in what way quantum machines, quantum algorithms could possibly help in assisting for, um, in solving meaningful machine learning tasks. So is there a scope for quantum assisted machine learning in one way or the other? So that's surely an, an interesting question. In fact, it's more than one question. So it's, it's a bouquet of questions if you want. So what does that mean? So ideally, we would like to have a sort of rigorous guarantee from a mathematical mindset, but I think this mathematical mindset is widely shared in the community I'm, I'm talking to these uh, in, in this very moment. One would like to have a rigorous guarantee for state-of-the-art algorithms for learning on real-world data sets. So we would think of data sets like, I don't know, pictures of cats and dogs. There's no talk on machine learning that doesn't mention pictures of cats and dogs, so here they are. Stock market data, protein configuration, some sort of meaningful data that could be used in training of the classical or quantum assisted um, algorithm. That's the data. Then we need an algorithm of a type, say stochastic gradient descent, expectation maximization, some sort of algorithm that deals with those real world data in a meaningful fashion. We need a model like neural networks as they're ubiquitous in the classical machine learning world, parameterized quantum circuits that I've already mentioned when I was talking to very about variational quantum eigensolvers. So um, circuits that would have a certain type of like certain families of knobs that are being tuned in the course of the algorithm or probabilistic graphical models or any other model of that kind. And for that setting, one would like to see a quantum advantage of the, the quantum or quantum assisted algorithm over classical algorithms. I mean, that's at least the thing we would like to see. Now, what does that mean? And again, this means more than one thing. It could mean that we take data, pictures of cats and dogs, and want to see that we can learn better with fewer samples. We take samples, we need fewer samples to accomplish the same learning task. And if this is possible, we would argue that this is a, an advantage in sampling complexity. We could also take data, again, pictures of cats and dogs, and would think that we have a computational advantage in, in, the, in the sense that the algorithm would perform faster in, in, in the quantum world than in the classical world, and that would be a computational an advantage in computational complexity. Or we could have an advantage in generalization bounds, which are like bounds to the like guarantees of the performance of an algorithm given unseen um, data. These are all meaningful ways in which a quantum assisted algorithm could be possibly better than a classical algorithm. This is the type of advantage we would like to see. And even better, and I'm still young enough to dream, the dream would be to think of the kind of press from below and think of classical lower bounds on the one hand and quantum upper bounds and compare the two. Meaning we would be very specific on the quantum side and think of a specific algorithm like stochastic gradient descent or so, and think of a model like parameterized quantum circuits, again, of the type where there's knobs and you tune them using a classical algorithm and be like very, very specific on the quantum side and think that's my architecture, that's my algorithm that I run, that is my, my setting on the quantum side. But compare this with a very forgiving and very general classical setting and think of all classical learners, all models and all algorithms and ask, can this specific quantum algorithm be better than any possible conceivable learner for the same task? And this is the, the, the dream advantage we might want to have in mind. Good. And this is also the, the setting we have in mind for the rest of the talk, but we will be forgiving or more forgiving in one specific way, which is that we take the liberty to think about highly structured and fine-tuned data and ask the question whether we can make substantial question or substantial progress on this question in this 
demanding setting of a specific quantum algorithm being better than any possible conceivable learner, but for fine tuned data sets, not to oversell. So we allow ourselves to think of specifically structured data sets, but otherwise we want to see can quantum devices do better than classical learners, no matter what. And this is the premise of the first technical result we want to look at, where we ask whether there could be a proven quantum advantage in pack distribution learning in one way or the other. So what does that mean? We want to learn distributions or families of distributions. If you think about that, many problems in practical supervised and unsupervised learning can be seen as ultimately learning a distribution from a family of distributions. Now, that's sometimes called a concept class in, in machine learning language. That's kind of indexed by some parameter. And think of this as a, as a system size, if you want, if you want to think in physics in terms. Now, a generator would spit out samples from a distribution. You take seed randomness coming in, you roll a dice, and you, you take that randomness, and the guy, the, the generator, spits out samples from that distribution. That's a generator, and it would efficiently generate samples from a distribution, or rather a family of distributions indexed by this mentioned app. The task of the learner is to, to learn that distribution. It takes samples, stares at them, like pictures of cats and dogs, if you want, and then would be able to, to see what's going on. Now, what does learning mean? Let's be a bit more precise. It can mean many things, once again. And um, in particular, it can mean that it learns the distribution as such. That's sometimes called density modeling. And I have something to say about this. In fact, we are about to put out a paper, I don't know, maybe even tonight, on, 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 on density modeling, where the task is to evaluate probabilities or rather approximations of probabilities given the sample data, the, the training data that you have seen. So you take samples and want to say, what is the specific probabilities of a certain outcome to happen within the family of distributions? That is called density modeling. What we have in mind for most of the, of the talk, however, is so-called generator modeling, where you take samples or the learner takes samples, and then the learner thinks a bit, and then is aiming at spitting out new samples from the same distribution or, or pretty much the same distribution or a distribution that's nearby in a precise sense than the original one. So we take pictures of cats and dogs or Hollywood superstars for that matter. And then the general, this learner would generate new pictures of cats and dogs or Hollywood superstars. That is called generator modeling. And the task of the learner is to learn the generator of a distribution or again, rather a family of distributions, but let's not be too um, pedantic here. So can there be a quantum advantage? So are there distributions? Again, we allow ourselves to kind of tailor the distribution. That's, I don't want to oversell. That's the, the one freedom we, we pick that are efficiently quantum generator learnable for a specific distribution or family of distributions and a specific algorithm and a specific choice of settings, but which are not efficiently classical generator learnable, no matter what, for any classical learner of, of, of a type. Let's be a bit more precise here, but I think you will be forgiving me for showing epsilons and deltas. We keep it rather high level anyway. So the setting we are in is that of probably approximately correct learning, but I'm just saying the same thing as I said before in a, a slightly more precise language where the probably approximately correct learning or pack learning of distribution classes is of the following type where a distribution class, C, is efficiently pack learnable with respect to a distance D if there is an algorithm for which every D in that distribution class and every epsilon and delta given access to an oracle. Stop. What's this oracle? This is important to, to, to stress. So. We are not using sophisticated oracles like QPEX, QRAM, uh, QSample Oracle, where people have been arguing that much of the power of the quantum algorithm comes from the use of the oracle. You shouldn't be too surprised that you get an advantage if you have access to that type of oracle. The oracle we have in mind is the sample oracle that just takes classical data that you can write on a classical sheet of paper, having your classical brain or 
so they think maybe you have a quantum brain, but but never mind. Um, in the computer, in, in like classical data that you feed into the quantum device. So there's not a specific superposition oracle that you make use of here, but it's just classical samples that you use. And the, the input and the output are perfectly classical. You're also using a quantum algorithm in, in the middle. That's very important to stress. There's no cheating, no gimmicks with oracles. It's just classical data that you're reading it. And that outputs in time polynomial in all the parameters with probability at least one minus delta. So probably a generator of a distribution that is approximately correct, meaning that's kind of close in a meaningful distance. So again, you're taking um, samples and with high probability, you, you are able to spit out new samples from the same distribution, so pictures of cats and dogs. And then you think, and then you can uh, spit out new samples from pretty much cats and pretty much um, dogs. In, in a way. This is puck learning of distribution. There's a very nice mathematical language and framework to meaningfully capturing learning tasks. So again, can there be a quantum advantage, meaning other distributions which are efficiently quantum generator learnable, again, for a specific algorithm and a specific choice, with respect to the kullback leibler divergence or the relative entropy, if you want, and the natural sample oracle, again, taking classical data, and having a perfectly classical learning problem, but which are at the same time not efficiently classical generator learner, but by no classical learner. That's what you want to see. Is there a quantum advantage of such a kind? And the answer is yes, there is. There is such an advantage under a meaningful, like a, a, a small technical assumption that's very common under the, under the decisional diffie Hellman assumption for the group family of quadratic um, residuals. So there is a, an advantage in computational complexity. In fact, there's an exponential separation over, of quantum over classical learners. So quantum machines can do better in learning tasks than classical machines. That's very encouraging in, 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 in many ways. So there's a case, there's been lots of heuristic evidence that um, quantum machines can do better. That's wonderful by, work by Seth, I should say, who's, who might be in the audience. Uh, my friend at, at MIT who's done seminal work in this field. So he wanted to kind of pinpoint whether we can kind of find an advantage in distribution learning to kind of provide further meat to this, to this field. Now, how does the argument go? And um, even though that's a mathematical seminar, I have no time to go into the details of the, of the proof, but I, I throw in a couple of snippets of, of arguments in that on the highest level, you have to show that it's in one way or the other, quantum easy, you can do this with a quantum algorithm, and it's classically hard, meaning you can't do it classically efficiently. You might not be so surprised to hear that most of the work comes into play when proving the classical part. That's often like that. It's like a bit ironic that you're proving doing quantum stuff and think about quantum algorithms, but the hard bit is on the, on, on the classical side. It is what it is. So on the classical side, we stand on the shoulders of giants, in which case these are the shoulders of Kearns and collaborators who've been thinking deeply about the notion, notions of pseudorandom functions in this context coming from crypto, basically. And a collection of keyed functions would be um, a pseudorandom function. It, it cannot be distinguished from uniformly random functions by any polynomial time algorithm. So on the one side, you have just a couple of entries on your domain. In the other one, you have a uniform distribution on the domain and you have no polynomial time algorithm that would distinguish the, the, the two settings. So there's some constructions of these kind of pseudorandom functions. We have, we need a new variant of a Goldreich Goldwasser Michali tree construction to do that. That's kind of tailored to our setting at hand. This is very technical, very tedious, but it's also really much building mathematically on a on a developed mathematical framework that was developed in the in the 80s and early 90s, which we had to adapt to our setting. So it's hard work, but it is what it is. And Given such a pseudorandom function, the distribution classes are like uh, constructed by the so-called Kearns generator that just takes seed randomness and appends the output of that pseudorandom function after this, this, pseudo -ra this randomness. And that gives rise to a family of distribution, one that cannot be efficiently classically generated. Learned. It's a, it's a hard-to-be-learned classical distribution. Yeah, so no matter what you do, you cannot efficiently learn this distribution and it builds much on notions of security and 
for that reason, we have also a collaborator in our team that comes from security and it's really much fun to, to work with him who has a background in, in mathematical security in a way. This is part of the fun being in Berlin that there's, I mean, obviously in Boston, it's, <laughs> it's very similar and, and, and even better in a way, but you have like access to very smart people doing interesting um, things, which is a very generous state to be in. Now the, the actual construction is way more um, elaborate and complicated. Um, it's an entire polynomial reduction. Um, but at the lowest end of this hierarchy in the machine room of the proof, if you want, is a one-way function, in fact, a, a discrete logarithm of, of, of a kind. And then you think about this, wait a minute, discrete logarithms, one-way functions, we know how to crack when one-way functions. The gentleman who just won a breakthrough award just a couple of days ago, who happens to be affiliated um, with um, MIT, showed us in the 90s already, as one of the key seminal results of the field, how to uh, solve discrete log in polynomial time on a quantum computer. It was one of the biggest breakthroughs of the field. And for that reason, Peter Shaw uh, much deservedly won the, the breakthrough award. And on the highest level, the, the quantum algorithm would eventually um, work this uh, Goldreich, Goldwasser, Mikali tree backwards and cracks the hard to learn distribution class with a quantum computer that classically is impossible, but quantumly you can just walk the construction backwards, learning the distribution um, efficiently on a quantum device. So there is a proven quantum generator learning advantage. Quantum computers can do better. They can learn more efficiently than classical computers. In fact, exponentially better than classical devices. That's enormously encouraging. It's great to see. Um, it also complements work by IBM that came out at, a, at the same time that was thinking about kernel methods by IBM. Um, and it's great to see. So there is a case, quantum computers can do better, exponentially better in computation complexity than classical machines. And there's no gimmicks, no cheating, no funny Oracle access. It's really classical data, classical distributions. It's all great. but it works for highly fine-tuned distribution classes, yes. And um, it makes use of presumably a full-scale quantum uh, um, a quantum computer. So presumably, um, uh, like um, uh, presumably um, a fully photoelectric quantum computer. It's not very near term, if you want. So um, it will not not be very NISCI if you want, but, um, it, it, but it is what it is, but quantum computers can do exponentially better um, than classical computers in meaningful learning tasks. Which brings me to the second and shorter part of this talk. I wanted to be short, I have a bit of time for, for, um, for questions at the end. So we've seen up to now, 20 minutes, 27 minutes into the talk that um, quantum computers can do better in meaningful learning tasks and that lives up to mathematical rigor, so we are a mathematical um, group here. So this is a, a proven quantum advantage, very encouraging. Quantum machines can do better, but again, this is for highly fine-tuned um, uh, concept classes and the algorithm is not, not very nisky to be fair, but requires a full uh, full-torrent quantum computer. So the next question is, um, can we set up some probabilistic modeling problem for which a general purpose and better NISCI quantum learning algorithm can obtain a concrete formal advantage over classical learning algorithms, no, no, no matter what. So this is surely an interesting question, but it is not so easy to get a, get a grip at. So after all, with the discussed advantages are like very much fine-tuned by practical hands-on learning problems that, that involve pictures of cats and dogs that we have seen at the very beginning, have, they do not really admit so much of a precise mathematical description, at least not to the knowledge, to my knowledge. And the methods we are using are like methods like restricted Boltzmann machines, generative adversarial networks, like guns and, 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 and so on. So we need a kind of a tool, a, a vehicle in the question, can we find a near-term quantum classical separation? And what could be more natural than looking at short quantum circuits in the first place? Or rather, 
output distributions that are being obtained by performing measurements on the computational basis of the states of short quantum circuits. So let me be, 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 uh, to be clear. So this could be just the, the output distributions of the variational quantum eigensolvers or so that we've just um, talked about, or these quantum advantage setting, these random sampling schemes, these quantum supremacy schemes, although this term is falling a bit in disfavor, like these short circuits where you take measurements. These are the devices that we have today. And these guys we look at and see them as generators of certain distributions, namely distributions that you can generate quantumly. Sometimes they're called um, quantum circuit born machines, hinting at the born rule that is applied when computing probabilities of quantum measurements. Again, so you interpret this circuit as a generator for the output distribution, and you, you take the circuit, you take measurements, and you get samples of the output distribution. And we ask, um, given this distribution, and we are mostly looking at nearest neighbor quantum circuit, that's a bit of a detail. Can you learn the outputs of, 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 this, of this kind? And that's a way more Niski question asking, can the devices we have, or rather the output distributions of devices we have, be, be learned um, classic? Now, that's not the full learning algorithm as such, but these are like elements, like these are primitives in actual variational learning, uh, actual learning algorithms that should be clear. So, this is something that we need, we often need to know, find out a way of how to learn output distributions of. Um, of, 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 of the device, or let's refine this a bit. So are the output distributions of local quantum circuits puck learnable um, by both quantum and classical general purpose probabilistic modeling algorithms? And that's a crime story of the first league. Hi, Seth, good to see you. <laughs> um, so there's ups and downs, there's go theorems and, and, and no go theorems and, 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 and so on. That's, that's interesting. and. There have been quite many conjectures on the market on how this works or doesn't work, what, what must be possible, how, for example, simulation and learning is connected. There's like urban legends and, and rumors, like what it means. Like if you can simulate something, you should be able to learn it. Or if you can learn it, you can simulate this. There's lots of conjectured um, connections in the, in, in, in the field. Like what's the connection to black box verification? Presumably you can't black box verify distributions or can you can you learn them or presumably that means you can't learn them so there's a lot of um folk knowledge around and we wanted to sit down and see a bit more systematically what's going on and come up with a with a pretty comprehensive answer on the learnability of output distributions of short quantum circuits and in fact we came up with a pretty nice Comprehensive answer, I should say, and on the on the on the highest level, we have like negative and and a positive um, results. So let me give a couple of examples, and I'm almost um that was already already almost the end of the talk, but I, I, I promise you to be short. I think it's it's a good thing to have time for discussions. So first of all, you you go to the lab, or <laughs> somebody else goes to the lab again. Let, don't let me in, um, and you take data. And you say, can you learn the data, the, the output distribution in the pack learning sense, like in the in the distribution pack learning sense from the from the sample oracle? And as a first negative result, or let's maybe meditate a bit before what, what it means. So clearly they are hard to simulate classically. Right? So I mean, that's the whole point of, of this bombastic quantum supremacy, quantum advantage stuff that you have circuits and then you take the output distribution. And you can do that quantumly, that's the whole point, but you cannot classically sample from the same or a similar distribution. So that's good that we know this already, but are they hard to learn? Now, well, it depends. For very shallow circuits, like depth one circuits, you have product distributions and they're presumably easy to learn. That's, at least that's what you expect. I mean, how, how, how can this be difficult? You take samples and then you just basically invert it. For very deep circuits, you can approximate arbitrary distributions to arbitrary accuracy. And that can't be easy to learn. So that must be a hard to learn distribution. So, so where does the hardness precisely set in? So at what point does it become hard to learn the output distribution of a, of a quantum device? And 
what does it mean for quantum, for classical and quantum learners? So can even quantum computers in a way learn their own output distribution? It's a bit of an ironic and interesting twist. Now as a first result, and a first negative result, if you want, is that if a meaningful um, technical assumption is true, so if standard secure pseudo random function exists, then a depth basically linear circuit is already hard both for generative and density modeling. So again, for the distribution and for being able to create new samples from the distribution. And to add insult to injury, this is true for quantum and for classical algorithms. So this time pseudo random functions cannot be broken by quantum algorithms. And that means that if you have a, a pretty short circuit still, like a, a pretty much constant depth circuit, you can't learn the output distribution in, 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 the, in, the, in the generator and density modeling sense both quantumly and classically, which also means that it's kind of funny and weird, and there cannot be a quantum advantage because not even the quantum computer can, can learn that distribution. It's an interesting obstruction. If you think about this, it's kind of an interesting obstruction to algorithms that make use of data of, of, of this kind. Maybe more to the point of practical algorithms is notion, uh, notions of statistical query models or, or oracle so so what is this so learning algorithms are given access to an oracle a statistical query oracle if they if queried with a function responds to some number that's guaranteed to be at most some tower away from the expectation value of the function with respect to the target distribution that sounds fanciful but basically you're just taking expectation values so that's basically what most of the mill learning algorithms would do and also these variational learning algorithms you take data you take expectation values and then from these expectation values, you would do something and you would kind of learn and would take next steps in, 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 in this setting. So how hard is it to learn output distributions, again, in the puck sense, when you have access to statistical query oracles? Now it gets even funnier in that already um, log depth circuits are hard to learn from statistical query. And that's kind of, cute and interesting and strange. If you think about the fact that this type of Oracle access is what generic learning algorithms usually have access to. So um, from expectation values, even a log depth circuit is hard to learn or the output distribution rather of log depth circuits. And even funnier, this even holds for Clifford's. So how, do, how more, much more classically efficiently simulated but does it get if you have a log depth Clifford circuit I mean, come on, <laughs> you can compute this in your, in your head um, and you can still not uh, uh, learn the output distribution using SQ oracles. I should also give credit to Anschutz and Keanu who've also thought about similar notions in the past of SQ oracles. Um, it's important to, to, to stress the, 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 the rules. Okay, so here we are log depth um, in, in, in a way and it's already hard. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So this is kind of funny because these are again, clearly classically efficiently simulated, but so, Motivated by this, we thought, wait a minute. So how do simulation tasks and learning tasks precisely relate to each other? So here's simulation, here's learning, and what's the precise interconnectedness of these seemingly related concepts? And there have been lots of rumors and, and urban legends about this, and we wanted to look at this a bit more, given in particular that seemingly Simple distributions seem to be hard to learn while they are efficiently um, classically simulated. Now, the mother or father of all classically simulatable distributions are, of course, those that are generated by Clifford circuits. That's what we learn in kindergarten, depending on your education system. Um, so, Clifford circuits are hard to are easy to simulate. Right, that's true by virtue of the Gottes Manil theorem, um, and that's true both in the strong sense and the weak sense of simulation, meaning. Of course, you can sample efficiently from the output distribution of, of Clifford circuit, that's called weak simulation, or you can also compute the probabilities, that's called strong simulation. Either way, Gottes Manil theorem does the job for you. That's great. That's kind of quantum mechanics 101. You learn this really in, in I don't know, uh, in, 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 in high school. And if you think our uh, output distributions of Clifford circuits easy to learn, it will be a relief after all this misery and pain that. Yes, you can learn them. Yeah, from the sample oracle, you can efficiently learn them. For Clifford circuits of any depth, they are easy to learn. 
And it's actually not so trivial if you think about this, because after all, there's still lots of Clifford circuits. There's exponentially many, right? So it's not so trivial. And besides, you don't want to learn the Clifford circuit, but the output distribution of a Clifford circuit, which is not the same thing. So it's a bit subtle, but not infinitely subtle <laughs> if you want. You can learn that. So it turns out that Clifford circuit output distributions are uniform over a fine subspace of the finite n-dimensional vector space F2. And um, so a finite um, field. And then you can do basically like a, a finite field variant of a Gaussian elimination to, to work yourself backwards and, and, and learn the output distribution. So that's good. Clifford circuits provide distributions that are easy to simulate, both weakly and, and strongly, and they're also easy to learn um, in, 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 the, in the sample or the set. Good. So far, so good. Now we know that you can do stuff by adding T gates. So that's kind of the, 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 the common uh, the way we think about modern quantum computers, we think of having Clifford's gates. Like if you think of like surface code, topological, photon quantum computing, we think of performing Clifford gates with like lattice surgery on, on large scale um, surface code patches and so on. And these are great. These are transversal gates in the, in, in the setting, but they're not universal. So we need to beef up the schemes to fully universal schemes. And what people usually think of doing is you add T gates and that's a pretty costly prescription, meaning you can't do T-gate, so you would add T-gate resources, but that would be noisy because you can't do the fault tolerance. So you would generate noisy T-gate resources, and then you massage them and, and clean them up by so-called magic state distillation. Then you make these nice, cleaned up, distilled T-gate resources, and then you teleport them in and use them to, to gate teleport things in to get a T-gate and then uplift this to a universal scheme. And that's enormously costly. And most of the costs of fault tolerant quantum computing comes from magic state distillation and the, the logical computation is, is just a teeny weeny corner and sitting there in, in, in the center. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this that morally speaking, the pain grows usually monotonously in the number of T gates you add. That's I think a fair statement. Also in simulation, that's very crisp and very clear, meaning uh, you can afford a logarithmic number of T gates in a simulation weakly and strongly it's kind of clear that you got to for example if you add one t gate it's just a superposition of two options and you simulate this branch you simulate that branch and you mix them and, and you're done in, in in weak simulation so it's kind of clear that if you have a number of t gates the effort grows exponentially in the number of t gates but for a log number of t gates you can perfectly efficiently simulate the setting at hand so logarithmically many t gates can be afforded in classical efficient simulation how about learning? Strangely, you take your T-gate, your expensive resource, you put it into the Clifford circuit, and you take a single T-gate, you put it there, and from this one Clifford gate, uh, T-gate, boom, the Clifford circuit becomes hard to learn. So a single T-gate renders learning hard um, in worst case complexity, I should say. But circuits with log many T gates can, of course, be classically efficiently simulated. So it's a very strange, I don't want to call it a phase transition. That's a bit overstated. Everything is a phase transition, but it's kind of a funny transition from easy to hard by adding a single T gate. But of course, you can e clearly simulate that still, but the learning task is, is, is very different and it becomes hard to learn. Very strange and presumably counterintuitive observation that shows how, how intricate the, the learning task of output distribution is at the end of the day. So I'm 42 minutes into the talk. So I, I take the liberty to procrastinate a little bit, um, but not too long. I, I keep it short um, because I, I can't contain myself. I just have to say it because it's kind of very strange in that, okay, something very different, namely unitary designs. You might know that unitary designs are beautiful mathematical structures and they're also very useful in quantum information in that they mimic Haar measure averages. Or more precisely, a unitary design is a finite collection of unitaries with the property that their average resembles the low moments of the Haar average. So a unitary three design would be a collection of unitaries so that if you average over them, you get the same third and second moments as the, as the Haar measure. And they are super important in all kinds of quantum information, like in randomized benchmarking, they're bread and butter. You would use two designs, in quantum thermodynamics, you use four designs. I'm sure that in this um, in the seminar, you've seen designs many, many, many times. 
that are really important and, and, and interesting. So random circuits also give rise to designs. But commonly, the, the, it gets very costly in the, in the order of the design, well, for, for, for maybe obvious reasons. Now, Clifford circuits are relatively easy to do. I've already said this, but unfortunately, there are only three designs. And they just so gracefully fail to be four designs. Just not. I mean, from a representation theory, theoretical understanding, you're there. It's, it's, it's almost the representation of a, of a, of a four design that, that you get, but, but not quite. So there are three designs. So it can uplift random Clifford circuits to arbitrary order designs by putting in T gates. But how many of them do you need? Now, interestingly, think of like a 10,000 qubit machine. And this 10,000 qubit design machine, you want to uplift to a 20 order, a 29 order design. Now it turns out that you take like five T gates, a constant number, put them there. And this T gateness, this un universality spreads out and mixes, goes all over the place and uplifts these 10,000 qubits to a 29 order design, independent of the system size. So a constant number of T gates is good enough to uplift a, a three order design to an arbitrary order design using Clifford circuits. No? <laughs> so this was a highly technical result. It was a very technical proof. Um, we took the liberty to, to call the paper on the archive joking the quantum homeopathy works because like quantum homeopathy, you take your resource and you exponentiate this infinitely many times and it still works. Um, it's, it's a bit of a joke. We didn't dare to call it like that for communications and mathematical physics where it will appear anytime um, in the next days, but it's a German journal, you don't make these jokes. Anyway, it's a technical result that a constant number of T gates for a meaningful way of approximating um, designs in, 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 for super operators, a constant number is sufficient to get an arbitrary order design, which is kind of another funny twist of uh, T gates coming in. Here it's, it's mathematically very unrelated, but morally very much related to the beautiful work by Aloshia Hammer, who has also observed already um, more heuristically the, the beautiful insight. We are really shopping this that T gates have, have funny resources and, and, and you can get lots of mixing by adding a single T gate. And that, that is where this whole thing started from. I want to give proper credit I'm here. Good. 46 minutes into the talk, I think that's a good moment to, to, to come to an end. So this talk, the second part was related to rigorous, first rigorous insights into the learnability of output distributions of quantum circuits. And this makes a lot of sense if you think about these guys being like the primitives in more sophisticated learning algorithms. You have to understand this to, to, to learn how learners learn in a way. So that's a good start from the, from the mathematical rigorous perspective. And we made quite some progress into understanding the learnability of the outputs of quantum circuits with all its ups and downs. We also found that the connection between simulation and learning is intricate, way more intricate than was thought in the literature. And we found heavy obstructions to proving quantum advantages. Sometimes quantum computers can't do better than classical machines in learning output distribution. So quantum computers can't learn their own output distributions. It's a bit funny when you think about this, it is what it is and it's a proof. Now um, we've settled this, but again, give proper credit, we are not the first to ask these questions. There's a very beautiful paper that, to be fair, I think I'm not offending anyone, doesn't have many answers, but it asks very beautiful questions on the learnability of our distributions and ask these intricate questions between the connections of quantum advantage, supremacy, and learning simulation of born machines and ask all these questions about the connections that we have basically settled and then looked at quantum supremacy and born machines and because of that, I had the somewhat bombastic but really funny title, uh, The Born Supremacy, because it's looking at supremacy of born machines. Now we sat down, did our homework in this very nitty gritty, very, very German way, and, and proved things. Oh, oh. and we've understood. I'm what sorry. Happened. What happened here? Uh, unfortunately, the screen stopped sharing. You need to share again. Okay, good. Um, good. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, good. So we've sat down, did our homework and, and, and so on. And then we understood the identity of, of these things and the, and the identity of, of the collection of learning, learnability and supremacy and, and bomb machines. I thought, why? That's great. We should um, call our follow-up paper, the Born Identity. 
well, unfortunately, I didn't get this past my my um my referees and my, my co-authors. So we have a very had a very technical title of this, but but never mind. Um, that's what, what it is. I should say that this is part of a bigger program in our group. I, I keep it short. We have work on generalization bounds for parameters quantum circuits that rigorously assesses generalization in a, in a neat way. Ask me if you are interested in this. Also, we looked at limits of machine learning by looking at classical surrogates and their kind of settings where you can also as well classically do the same thing, kind of challenging quantum advantages, which is an interesting setting and see how noise can help in a paper that will come out any time over the next days. And again, maybe tonight, depending on, on how it goes. I will not say more about this. If interested, ask me about this. But rather 49 minutes into the talk, come to the end. So this talk was very fixed, very focused and, 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 and narrow in its scope. Sorry about this. But um, we had a single question in the, in, the, in, in the center of all this, namely how we can tackle learning tasks, meaningful machine learning tasks with quantum computers. And we, while the talk was a bit um, like high level, it should be clear that all what I say would, is living up to the rigor of mathematical physics. We wanted to see what's on, this, on the plate from the mathematical physics perspective and asking questions, can quantum computers learn better than classical machines? Very encouragingly, we found that for distribution learning, there's a, a, an advantage of quantum computers over classical machines, in fact, an exponential advantage in puck learning of quantum machines over classical devices with a perfectly honest oracle. Everything is fine, classical data, classical everything, except that we took the liberty of fine tuning the data at hand, but otherwise it's a, it's a proven and exponential separation, which is very encouraging. There is a field, uh, there is a, 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 a case on, on, on our plate. Motivated by this, we were looking at more near-term settings and looked at goals or no goals and found that there's obstructions in learning the output distributions for local quantum circuits. There, yeah, they're not even quantum computers can do everything. That's interesting to see. And a single T gate can render learning hard, which is kind of funny if you think about that. It's also challenging the connection between stimulation and learning that's much more intricate than what people commonly thought, including what I thought in, 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 in the past. So on the highest level, highly structured, highly engineered distributions can give rise to exponential advantages in learning. That's great. Now, if you look at the more dodgy, um, noisy distributions of like random circuits, you do measurements where there seems to be no quantum advantage. So the highly structured case has an advantage. The, the no structure case has no advantage. So what is happening in the, in the interesting room in the middle? So how much structure is needed at the end of the day to have a meaningful quantum advantage? And while I do not know the answer, I would love to know the answer. And I would also see this as an invitation for you to look at the question of, with a rigorous mindset, think of the question whether quantum computers can possibly assist in doing and tackling meaningful learning tasks. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions you might possibly have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. That was a wonderful overview and very interesting talk, and I'm sure it will generate a great deal of discussion. So I've turned off the screen sharing, and I hope that people who ask questions will turn on their video so we can see you and have a, a good interchange. Who, who's going to ask the first question? I'm sure there are many. Roy? Agens. I do have a question. So in your uh, theorem for single T-gate makes learning hard, um, we're assuming that the family uh, of circuits constructed from local Clifford circuits and a single T-gate is hard to learn. But yeah. do you think there exists a sort of a subset of this family which can be shown to be easy to learn? Ah, that's a good question. So I mean, the, the I hadn't said how even if not I, don't, I have not even hinted at the, at the at the proof. It's actually interesting that we we um, make use of a polynomial reduction that um, results to parity learning with noise, which is kind of interesting if you think about this because there's no noise in our circuit. But um, the the T gate that we use is kind of in a way immersing the right type of noise so that this kind of polynomial reduction works. But that wasn't your question. Your question was basically. Uh, saying that, oh, this is a result of worst case complexity, but can you think of instances where this is not, not the case, which are not hard to learn? And the answer is clearly yes. I mean, look, think of a depth one circuit 
the Clifford and you place the T gate right at the beginning. Clearly, I can learn this. I just check where's the T gate to them and, and done, right? So in this sense, there's clearly trivial examples of a kind. There's surely also less trivial examples. And um, well, that's the, the, the problem with average, with worst case complexity. But we also have a project in the making um, where we look at average case hardness of distribution. That's maybe technically even more interesting what I've said today, but that's for another time. But we have results in the making that also tackle questions of average case complexity or average case hardness, because you're precisely right. It really depends where you place it. Also at the very end, I mean, you just undo it. You, that's a very good observation. Thank you for this. Right. Very well, smart. One more question, if, if I can. No, um, I so in this correct. proof, you assume that you can construct some, some sample circuit, which is like constructed from Hadamards, a T gate, and these C not gates. What if you restricted your gate set? So what if you took out these Hadamards in your circuit family? I mean, if you restrict this gate set, then can sort of a family be easy to learn? Ah. Um, um, I doubt it. No, well, I, I doubt it in the in the sense that for meaningful restrictions, like taking out Hadamards, it will not. It will still work. I mean, at the end of the day, the, for us, the the task is: can you still make this parity learning with noise problem work? And you surely can take out stuff, and you're you're still in business. But there's limits to that. For example, take out everything, and they have the identity. Then yes, I can learn it. It's just uh, an identity is a very simple group, right? <laughs> and then you have one T gate, and then done. So in this sense, yes, surely you are right. But the question is like, where's the boundary? Like my student had another thing out and that's something um, I was thinking about, about a lot in the past, but I was not involved in this. He did this as a single author note that he also appended to our QFP submission. We found out that even, even free fermions are hard to learn with, with um, uh, SQ Oracle. So if you are in, in, the, in the match gate fermion setting, like no fermion, uh, no, like the parity of fermion number is, is, is preserved, of course, but not the, the fermion number. That's also hard to learn. And that's really crazy because that's, I mean, how much, easy, how, how much easier does it get than free fermion uh, circuits? So that's not quite your question. You ask taking out stuff from the Clifford group, and I'm talking about a different group, but one that's smaller, so presumably simpler. Yeah, so that's a bit in your mindset, and that's still hard, hard to right. learn. So my suspicion is, you, you, you see, I'm a bit talking around it, right? I mean, my answer is, you can surely take out stuff and, and have a subgroup of the Clifford group. I'm sure this proof survives that. There's a limit to this because if you take out everything, then you're dead. Well, if you just have the identity, well, it is what it is. But you can also think of other groups like um, match gate circuits, ACA, not family number preserving uh, free family operations, and you're still in business. You, are, you still have that. But of course, we want to invite these questions. I mean, we're just at the beginning of this. So feel invited to, to also think about this. I mean, that's why I'm giving this talk. So even without these sort of Hadamards, you can still match this noisy parity distribution. I would think so. I, 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 I don't know this out of my head, but I would be very surprised if that wasn't the case. I see. Thank you so much. Are there Thank other you. questions? Hi, Seth. again. Hi, Our, Seth. Great to see you. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I, great I, to I, see I, you in person. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have to disagree with your statement that this talk is narrowly focused because I think <laughs> yes, it's <like>, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, I think it was a. It really throws light on a very general set of questions, and it's a very nice piece of work. My question for you is: Is there a computational complexity class of Clifford's with a constant number of T gates? What can you actually compute with that? It would seem to me that it's probably not very good at computing stuff even though it, it ends up being very hard to learn? Um, that is a very interesting question. I mean, that, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, I should say that um, we are thinking about um, like near-term complexity classes in a way to, um, together with uh, collaborators. Um, uh, like Garibian and, and, and others like log depth circuits and highly restricted circuits, but we have no strong results um, out yet. I mean, there's something, some blah, blah, that I could say, but it's really uh, at the beginning of the, of the story, but I, I'm much aware of this question. You're absolutely right that presumably it's not so powerful to have Clifford circuits with only a very small um, and restricted number of T gates. That's interesting because it's hard to learn. I mean, 
but uh, it's not very computation powerful. Surely, I mean, Clifford's plus one decade is like uh, completely idiotic and it's not going to be very powerful at all. And of course, we can clearly efficiently simulate this. So in the sense, we already know that a log depth number of Clifford's uh, of T gates can be afforded in classical simulation. So um, there cannot be a quantum advantage over that in, in, in a way. But if you think about this and, and add noise, it gets more interesting. It also gets more interesting if you add measurements. And that's, my, of course, much, no, much known that if you have very short circuits, but if you allow yourself to do measurement and adaption, you can do loads of things that are not possible. For example, mm -hmm. well, T, uh, GZ state generation is not possible with constant depth circuits because they're kind of topological in a way. Um, well, you know what I mean. Uh, the, the, the transfer operator of the, of the of the the gap of the transfer operator and as an MPS would not be would not be not be gap. And you can do that still with constant depth circuits and measurements. Um, so I'm a, a bit blah blahing around, but um, yes, it's an interesting question. So clearly, as I said, T, log many T gates can be classically simulated in Clifford circuits. So that's ruling that out, but there's still interesting flavors of near-term complexity classes. And I think that's a very important field. It's not started enough yet, and we are on it. But I think, given that we have devices at hand and we do stuff, we should better get a better handle at this. So, if this is a kind of a sentimental question, I am perfectly on your side. We should work harder on that. <coughs> yes, so I have. A, I have a second question, which I, no doubt you've thought about. Um, so, uh, do you think that the same result would hold in continuous variable circuits where the analog of Clifford gates are Gaussian operations? Does a single non-Gaussian operation combined with Gaussian operations make a continuous variable circuit difficult to learn? <laughs> I, I have to laugh because that's precisely the circuit the question I ask, ask my student because it's very natural. Like, I mean, you have these match gate circuits and then what's the bosonic analog? I think the argument still goes through, but I haven't checked yet, but it, it seems so. And I have to think of your beautiful past result that I'm too tempted to cite that if you just think of, of generators, we know that quadratic um, uh, polynomials in bosonic operators give rise to Gaussian operations. But if you add one non-Gaussian guy, like a, a quartic guy or so, you beef up um, the, 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 the gate set or the, 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 the reachable set of unitaries from Gaussian unitaries to a, a set that's dense in all unitaries. I mean, that's a famous result of, of Seth in the early days of continuous variable quantum computing if you want. And that adds to this spice and that would relate to that question, meaning that the Gaussian operations that in fact, I honestly think are already hard to learn. So that's diminishing that, that side a little bit, but you can ask the question like what's happening for Gaussian circuits and Gaussian plus a, a non-Gaussian thingy like your quartic um, unitaries. And that would give rise to a very nice um, flavor of, new flavor of learning, learnability, computation, simulation, and so on. We should maybe look at this together because that really nicely relates to your past work. It's a very good question. I would lo love to know the answer. To be fair, I know that I have the question on the radar, but I have no good answer to this, but it's a wonderful question. So are you oh, saying five four theory? I'm sorry. Again? <laughs> With a five four theory? <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Oh dear, um, <laughs> I can only conjecture. <laughs> Hey, did you just you Jens, ask your, your colleagues? Um, yeah, did, Jens, did you just say that you believe that Gaussian circuits for continuous variable that Gaussian circuits on their own are hard to learn in contrast to the Clifford case for qubit circuits? I, I mean, for, for fermions, we, we my student seems to know this. Like for that's already funny. Like for for parity number preserving fermionic operations, you seem to be this seems to give rise to distributions that are hard to learn, which is kind of crazy because. Free fermions are hard to learn in this sense. Kind of funny. And then oh, both, so, you, so your free fermion result then is that 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 is for Gaussian fermionic circuits that they're yes. hard to learn. Yes. Ah, yeah. Okay. I see. But and, but not but, but yeah. not particle preserving like these. I mean, you, you know, there's like you, uh, the particle number preserving would be U N the U N freedom, but it's like an S O two N freedom, like Majorana fermions if you want. Uh, that's I funny. I mean, I, 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 I'm also astounded by this. It's not published. It's also my students' work. But I mean, maybe I should not say this here. But uh, well, it come out. It will come out anytime anyway. But um, yeah, that's funny. I, 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 if you're astounded, I'm astounded too. <laughs> okay, but you, you don't know the answer for for bosonic 
Uh, no, 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 uh, I don't. And no, I don't. But we are, I mean, the, the, I mean I'm now in the, the airport at the moment. It does love airport <laughs> of all places. But I'm back. I will look at this question. Thank you. Great talk. Yeah, thank you. That's very kind. So there are other questions. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to understand the context of these uh, learning experiments. So are you generating the um, are you generating the quantum data uh, by using this, uh, these uh, Clifford circuits with added T gates and then feeding the wave function to this like uh, quantum machine? Or are you performing like some set of like measurements on these, uh, uh, on these quantum circuits and then feeding classical data into the quantum circuit? And ah. like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, the, the answer is very easy. The, set, the second, I do take measurements. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I have my quantum circuit, I take measurements. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jens, we lost your audio. Jens, you're frozen. Ah. Maybe he got on the plane. Yeah, it looks that way. <laughs> So we should have a little discussion here. Now, in one of the results, uh, he'll probably come back soon, but Jens assumed that the standard secure PRF exists. Is, does that go through all of the later things? Do you know? I don't know. Oh. He's back. Ah, you're back, good. I, I, I'm back. Sorry, I apologize. Um, you know what happened? Somebody called me and then the internet broke down over this. I'm so very sorry. Yeah, what I did, I wanted to say, or what I did say is you have a random circuit, of course, you can undo the circuit and then you can do something. So it makes a big difference whether you measure along the way or you, you have access to the quantum state. You don't have access to the quantum state. You take classical data and then okay. you do something. Okay. So these, res these results would not apply to the case where like you prepare like some some quantum state and then you have this like second layer of uh, like quantum machine right like you you prepare the state and then you have the quantum machine right and then you uh, perform measurements on these and maybe like feed it to a classical machine so would these results like apply to these kind of cases where you have this like extra layer of like quantum machine before feeding it to a classical machine um not really in, in the sense that what the data we have are classical data from the circuit and then you can do whatever i mean the, it, i was actually addressing your case, the case that you mentioned in the sense that my quantum learning thing was you take the output distribution you feed that into as many layers of quantum stuff yet as, as you want in fact i was asking can a quantum computer learn these distributions and it turns out no but yes you can you can, uh, in, in, in your language, that means you have, a, you have a circuit, you take data, and then you have another layer of quantum stuff, and that quantum computer will have its own output again. Because yeah. quantum computers are computers, they have inputs yeah. and outputs. So yeah. at some point, there will be another classical output. Yeah. But that just means, in your language, you take a quantum circuit, you measure, you take another quantum circuit, and you measure, and that was actually even, I mean, now I can say that's precisely what we studied. So we have a theorem on that. So yes. It's just a different language of, of, of saying what I what I have said. Yes, you can accommodate this. It's a wonderful question. <clears throat> okay. So, Jens, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the um, claims about XED as a measure of quantum supremacy. And you didn't mention the work of Shen Gao, who's on our call. I wonder if Shen has any comments about this. Yeah. Um... Hi, Jens. I I'm Shreen. Hello. And yes, hello. You. Good Hi. to see you. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry. I, I don't get as much as 
<laughs> no, I mean, I think there's, there's lots of, I mean, the linear cross entry benchmark is, is, is wonderful. It's a great tool and so on. It's, it's, it's great. But I mean, you have to face the reality that, that um, these things are intricate and, and, and verification is not easy. I mean, in, in some way, it's even provably impossible, right? I mean, like, well, I, I mentioned this briefly in, in, in passing, like black box verification is impossible, meaning uh, you take polymeny samples and the, the, the verifier would, if you get samples from precisely the right distribution, except with probability two thirds, and uh, would, if you get a distribution that's epsilon away or more from the anticipated distribution, would accept with a probability of one third or so, um, that uh, this is a meaningful way of verifying. And for boson sampling, IQP circuit sampling, random circuit sampling, this is probably impossible. So in this sense, you, you can't black box verify these, these guys. And then you have to do something else. So you have to work around that and linear cross entropy benchmarking is a good compromise. Although again, it's not computationally efficient. So like the Google people, I mean, the, if you look at this monstrous abstract, a good chunk of the uh, appendix, sorry, the good chunk of the appendix is kind of slicing the random circuit into little sub chunks that you can still classically, just so classically simulate so that they can do the, 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 the estimate the probabilities that they need for the linear cross entropy benchmark. So that's, it's highly interesting. And then I find this whole question of verifiability and so on beautiful and, and, and exciting. So, okay. so you think even we have proved some limitations on XEB, you still think uh, this quality is still a, a good, good way to benchmark quantum device? Oh, you know this better than me. I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I, this is a more like an ethical <laughs> question. I mean, in this review article that I mentioned, we really went into all the nitty gritty fine print of the ups and downs and what it all means. I don't know. Um, well, you, you judge for yourself. I mean, it, you have to do something. So it's, it's a great thing to have, I would say. <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Very, um... <laughs> Thanks for the many good questions. That's really wonderful. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Of course. Sure. Yeah. 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 So uh, in your talk, you mentioned the Calibre circuit can be rendered efficiently, um, but the uh, plus one single T is hard to learn based on the hardness of learning noisy parity function. That's right. So, yeah, it seems that the, so the clipboard circuit with a single like noisy channel, like the depolarizing channel is also hard to learn based on this argument. Ah, wonderful point. I think, yes, this is a good point because our, our, our like, that's actually a very, very cute observation. And that my my second part was like NISKIA and that was about short circuits or relatively short circuits and measurements, but it was not noisy. So you come along and rightfully so, I say, wait a minute, I'm kind of using this kind of funny reduction to look at a noisy parity learning problem. Why don't you look at noise in the first place? And that's right. I think you could also accommodate a little bit of a noisy thing and that would be the same thing. That would also be hard. Yes, you're right. Uh, but yeah, but in your last slide, you also mentioned the noise will help. So it makes me confused. <laughs> so. Well, the noise have no, this is funny. This is funny. This is funny. This this actually in this in this coordinate system that adds a dimension, if I may say so. I didn't mention this in the talk because Seth is right. It was, I don't know, it was focused in its research question, but it was still meandering through the theme in, in, in some ways. I didn't want to open the another dimension on, on noise because we know that noise is very funny in simulation. I mean, a, a big chunk of the review article I mentioned was looking at at noisy um, sampling tasks. And we know um, that if you add noise to circuits, they become easier to simulate in, in, in many ways, right? I mean, there's, there's um, noisy circuit sampling, there's some sort of tensor contractions and so on that are a bit like noise. Um, uh, and uh, they make the, the, the classical simulation much easier. Also in boson sampling or Gaussian boson sampling, if you add noise, it becomes easier. There's even a threshold from which on you can do, you can do efficient classical simulation in the in the weak simulation sense of Gaussian boson sampling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Long story short, noise helps on the classical side. It makes it easier. It makes it more classical, and that's absolutely not surprising. That the more classical it gets, the easier it gets. It, it's less quantum. The advantage is gone. I mean, if it gets dodgy and noisy, of course it helps. So you think, and and for weak simulation oh. it's true now you come along and i mean 
Of course, we've thought about that too. You say, wait a minute, you add real noise, it makes it harder to learn. And that seems to be true. So in this sense, there's another twist to the story, meaning that noise comes in in a very non-intuitive fashion, that it can make things harder, not easier. That seems to be right. We haven't nice. written that up. And the adding this one noisy gate was a bit stupid. But of course, what you want at the end is a, a proper noisy circuit. And, and we, we are thinking about this. But that would be funny if noise makes it harder, not easier, in cert, at least in certain settings. I don't know. I find that interesting. And I share okay. your sentiment. Yeah, but, but let me uh, add, um, uh, come up to another point. It's the noise that will make the generalization uh, easier. That is probably right. Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. I mentioned this at the very beginning of the talk that generalization is something we should have on the radar, and, and that's right. Yeah, yeah. good point. I, I share your sentiment. It's a very good, good point. Very educated questions. Very nice. But then I'm speaking to MIT and Harvard. What do you expect? <laughs> Seth, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I was just shaking my head at the notion that that because you're speaking to MIT and Harvard, the people are educated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. Well, I'm afraid if we get I, onto that topic, we could go on all a, day. So I, I think I, we should to thank Jens yeah, for I think statistically speaking, this is a true statement. <laughs> you're Good. generalizing. <laughs> I'm generalizing, exactly. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm using statistical queries, I would say. <laughs> Well, it's, probably, it's really it's really okay to have nerdy jokes that's for sure it's accepted um social behavior yeah so <laughs> Good. thank you very much jens and we look forward Wonderful. to so your, go back to my work. consulting there was so Good. much you told us today and so many papers you brought up we we'll, we have a great deal of work to do and i hope that we can continue and have contact with you Wonderful. You also spoke to my student uh, a couple of days ago here. So let's catch, let's keep in contact and, and, and do something. Great.